Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new session of our department's research seminar. That's the Department for Theoretical Philosophy at the University of Bucharest. And the research seminar is organized jointly with CELFIS. That's the Center for Logic, Philosophy, and History of Science at the same university. Um, for this fall, I'm delighted that our uh, speaker for today is Gene Mills from Virginia Commonwealth University. Professor Mills will be speaking to us about folk psychology and natural properties. Gene is a wonderful friend, a wonderful human being, and a fantastic scholar. So we're very much looking forward to this. And Gene, please take it away. Well, uh, thank you, Andre, for that warm and uh, lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I suspect that like me, most of you would rather we could be meeting in person. The charms of Zoom have worn off over the last few years. On the other hand, Zoom does uh, allow us to have meetings with people all over the world that we otherwise wouldn't have had. And so it, for that reason, I'm grateful for Zoom and I'm grateful to you, Andre, for uh, the invitation and to everybody for showing up. So I wanna to talk to you about um, folk psychology and natural properties. Um, I should tell you that the, the argument that I'm gonna give you is largely a, a, a negative one. Um, a destructive one, if you like. Uh, and, you know, in general, my attitude is merely critical arguments are not as interesting as positive ones that are trying to put forward some new solution or something like that to a philosophical problem. But the target in this case is a very large one. Uh, and for that reason, I think that even a, a merely critical argument has a lot of significance. It's like bringing down an elephant, not a squirrel. Um, so, um, there's unquestionably some sense of the word natural in which we think of some properties as natural ones and some as not. So um, I'm a dog lover, take the property of being a dog. There's an intuitive sense in which that's a natural property in the sense that um, we're, at least the dog lovers among us are inclined to notice that something is a dog, to uh, entertain beliefs in which the notion of being a dog figures, perhaps to form generalizations about dogs and so on and so on. Um, we um, don't do that with respect to other properties. For example, the property of being a, uh, a bacabo. Now you may wonder what a bacabo is. You've probably never heard of it. So let me uh, share my screen if I can figure out how. Here we go. And I will show you what a bacabo is. Maybe. Let's see, why is this not scrolling? Okay, I've got it open, but the scrolling keys for some reason have just stopped working. Maybe I can do it a different way. Hold on, sorry about that. Ah, the wonders of technology. Here we go. There we go. For some reason, it didn't want to do it before. Okay. Let me see if I can go back to the regular view now. Oh, there we go. Okay. So that is a back of hope. Um, this is a picture of a large uh, flightless parrot from New Zealand. Uh, here are two back opos. Okay. We have the large flightless parrot from New Zealand, and we have the banjo, an American uh, musical instrument with roots in Africa. And here are three back opos. Uh, I don't know if you have potatoes in Romania. <laughs> I think you probably do. Now, uh, a back opo is stipulatively defined as a thing that is a banjo, a kakapo, or a potato, okay? Uh, stipulatively defined here by me now. Now, I take that this is a paradigm case of a property that in whatever intuitive sense we think of properties as natural or non-natural, this counts as non-natural, right? Um, but I wanna argue that um, beyond this psychological sense of naturalness, which I think is uh, undeniable. Um, 
there's a deeper notion of naturalness, metaphysical naturalness, that is a mainstay in contemporary metaphysics that I think is ill-founded. And that's what I'm gonna be arguing today, that uh, on the most um, influential and most common conception of what it is for something to be a natural property, the property of being a back of O uh, turns out to be a natural property, or at least there's no good reason to think that it isn't one. Um, and if that qualifies as a natural property, then by a sort of natural and obvious extension, it's reasonable to think that uh, we have no reason to deny that all properties are natural, okay? So uh, here's the main thesis on the most common and influential understanding of metaphysically natural properties. It may be, for all we know, that being a backup hoe is a natural property. I'm not arguing that it in fact is one, only that we have no reason to deny that it is one. Okay, uh, and the obvious extension, this is just a placeholder, right, is that it may be for all we know that all properties are natural on a, on a wide understanding of what it is to be a property. Now, why does this matter? Um, well, because a corollary of the thesis, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this today, I'm gonna be worried about establishing the thesis, but it's an, a, a straightforward corollary of my main thesis that philosophical theories that depend crucially on a substantive distinction between natural and non-natural properties that what I'm calling the distinctivist view, the view that there's an interesting substantive distinction here are at best um, inadequately supported, okay? Um, I'm not gonna by the way spend the whole time going through the PowerPoint but I wanna just uh, do some introductory work here to get things started. So what are metaphysically natural properties supposed to do? Well, this is a list of um, of direct and indirect quotations from contemporary metaphysicians. A lot of these come from David Lewis, some come from David Armstrong, some come from Ted Sider, some come from Rosanna Keefe, and so on. Um, in the paper, they're all footnoted, but uh, I didn't want to clutter up the PowerPoint. But here's some things that they're supposed to do. They're supposed to serve as reference magnets and to determine the extension of their corresponding kind terms, whereas non-natural properties do neither. Metaphysically natural properties are supposed to be the ones relevant to causal powers. They're supposed to be the ones that make sense of the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic properties. They're supposed to resist vagueness in their sport corresponding kind terms in a way that their unnatural brethren do not. They're supposed to make for qualitative similarity, to carve nature at the joints, there's an old chestnut, uh, to be intrinsic, to determine sets of instances that are not that are ipso facto not entirely miscellaneous, to be just abundant enough to characterize things completely and without redundancy, to be highly specific, and, and this is important, they're supposed to be sparse, meaning that they are, they're supposed to be relatively few, okay? Um, now, there are different ways of, that's what natural properties are supposed to do. That's not uh, a definition of them. It's the description of the work that metaphysicians take them to be doing. So what are they supposed to be? Well, there's more than one conception of what makes something a natural property. Uh, a conception that is, um, I think, growing in influence right now is in terms of the grounding relation. So natural properties are those that ground all other properties or some other kind of determination relation. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that. It's um, uh, not because it isn't interesting, but just because it's a very different conception and um, not the one that is the most influential one. So I'm gonna stick to the most influential one, which is the gnomic conception. And on the gnomic conception, uh, to say that something is a natural property is just to say that it's a property that in some sense figures in or is invoked by or required by the laws of nature. Um, and so here is a, Quotation, this is from a, a paper by Hugh Miller. Um, and this will give you the idea of what natural properties are supposed to be. Natural properties are identified a posteriori by scientific theories construed as Ramsey sentences. That is as saying, for example, that there are properties C, F, and G such that in C circumstances, uh, all F events have such and such a chance of being followed by G events. If that statement is true, then there are such properties. And being a constituent of some such laws is all there is to being a natural property. In other words, and this is my emphasis, if we stated all the laws there are in a single Ramsey sentence, uh, sigma, 
The properties sigma would quantify over are all the natural properties there are. So um, I will take Miller's statement as capturing the meaning of the nomic conception of natural properties so that it may equally well be put this way. What it is to be a natural property is to be a property belonging to the domain of properties over which a Ramsey sentence stating all the scientific laws there are quantifies. Now, um, one little aside, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen, not because I'm not gonna keep going, but because I'm tired of looking at text. Um, <laughs> uh, one little aside is this. Um, you may have noticed that in the quotation from, um, from Meller, I put the word natural in square brackets in front of the properties. Um, there's a just a pure, I think it's a purely terminological question here about how we're using the term property. Uh, Meller and Armstrong fall on one side of it. Lewis falls on the other side of it, even though they, I think, share the underlying conception of what a natural property is. Um, so, you know, Lewis's conception uh, cashes out um, properties as just being uh, sets of things in various possible worlds. And so Lewis would be happy to say that there's a property of being a backup of. Um, it's just that he would say it's not a natural property. Uh, whereas Armstrong, um, and Meller both prefer the terminology of saying, look, it's not that being a back of Poe is a non-natural property. It's just not a property, period, <laughs> right? There ain't no such thing. Um, and so they think um, that the only properties there are are the ones that I'm calling natural. I do think this is merely terminological. And the reason is that uh, Meller and Armstrong and those who take that line um, are perfectly content to say that um, I can meaningfully assert that something is a backupo, and when I'm doing that, I'm saying something true, and that there is a concept associated with my use of the term. It's just that the concept doesn't correspond to a property, right? Um, so another way to put um, the thesis that I want to argue for is this. I could do it all in, in Armstrongian terminology. Instead of saying that all properties are natural, I could say that uh, all concepts correspond to properties. Right? So same thesis, different terminology. I'm not gonna worry too much about that. Okay. Um, so my argument is really pretty simple, kind of embarrassingly simple, I think. Um, and my plan, by the way, <clears throat> is to give you the argument, um, do a little bit of uh, expository work, making sure that it's clear what it is the argument is saying. Um, consider 27 objections. Now I made up that number. Uh, <laughs> consider a few objections. Um, and then if there's time, which I somewhat doubt, um, consider another way of responding to the argument, which is not to object to the argument as given, but rather to uh, recast the nomic conception in a way that it evades my argument rather than trying to directly answer my argument. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to get to that, but maybe it'll come out in discussion. Okay. Um, so two arguments. The core argument, and I wanna emphasize the core argument is not the argument that I'm endorsing, okay? It's an argument that I am discussing, but not endorsing. So the core argument is this. Uh, C1, if there is a true folk psychological theory, then all properties are natural. There is a true folk psychological theory, so all properties are natural. Uh, I think that argument is valid. It looks to me like it has the form of modus ponens. Uh, my argument um, is this. We have no good reason to think that the core argument is unsound or even plausibly unsound. Um, if we have no good reason to think that the core argument is actually or plausibly unsound, we have no good reason for thinking C3 to be implausible. That is, we have no reason for thinking it implausible that all properties are natural. Um, we have no, therefore, we have no good reason for thinking that C3 is implausible. Now, I want to emphasize that I'm not claiming that, therefore, we do have a reason for thinking that C3 is plausible. I'm perfectly content to be absolutely agnostic and just say that reason doesn't or shouldn't incline us one way rather than the other. Um, so that's why I say I'm not arguing that all properties are in fact natural, but just that we're, there's 
uh, no reason to think that they aren't, no good reason to think that they aren't. Okay. Um, so I need to say something about folk psychology. Um, the, the term folk psychology is uh, used with various senses. And so I wanna be clear about what I mean by it. Um, when this term was originally introduced, or at least when it originally came into currency in the philosophical literature, uh, it meant something very specific. It meant um, a psychological theory that all of us ordinary folk were either explicitly or implicitly committed to. And it was a theory that com was uh, composed of a bunch of laws. Um, so here's an example. This is coming. This is from Paul Churchland back in way back in 1981. Uh, for any x, for any p, for any q, if x believes that p and x believes that if p then q, then barring confusion, distraction, etc., uh, x believes that q. By the way, you might wonder, since this is the first example, why am I calling it L3? Well, why not? <laughs> it's because in uh, <laughs> in uh, Churchland's paper that I took this from. This is just one in a much longer list. I just picked this out because it's a nice example. Um, now, I want to say that uh, if folk psychology is characterized as Churchland and Dennett and people back then characterized it as a, as a theory that we are all tacitly or explicitly committed to, then uh, I deny that there is any such thing um, because there's no such theory that I endorse. And all it takes is one person dissenting to say uh, that there's no theory that we all endorse. So there you go. Um, I think that it's important for this view to, to work that, um, that L3 and its ilk uh, are to be understood as uh, empirical claims, not analytic truths. Now, of course, if this is truth, a lot depends on what gets built to that, etc. But on any ordinary reading, it just seems to me that there are plenty of times when people believe P and believe that if P then Q, um, and they don't seem to be confused or distracted, but they don't go on to believe that Q. I mean, they may just not be attending to it, for example. That doesn't mean that they're distracted or confused. Now, you might try and shoehorn that into the etc. Um, but uh, if you shoehorn everything into the et cetera, that's going to take care of case, in which case it's no longer an empirical, uh, empirical law. So I don't endorse uh, the claim that L3 is actually true, or certainly that it states a law. Um, but the wider reading of folk psychology is not uh, something that involves a commitment to a specific set of laws but simply an acceptance of the ontology that figures in these kinds of laws. So folk psychology is just on this wider view, just the view that, well, you know, we believe things, we want things, we fear things, we hope for things, right? Uh, it's mostly the propositional attitudes that are at issue. Folk psychology isn't limited to propositional attitudes. It includes things like pains and appearances and things like that, but the propositional attitudes are the one, ones that have gotten the most ink and the ones that I'm going to focus on. Now, as I said, I don't think L3 is actually true. Um, now, you might think that what the et cetera do, is doing is just really um, uh, invoking a ceteris paribus condition. And if that's how it's to be understood, uh, then I become more agnostic, right? Because understanding the applicability of the ceteris paribus condition is pretty tricky. So again, I'm not so much worried about, um, about whether L3 is true or not um, on any particular understanding, but the important point is this. If there is a true theory that involves laws linking beliefs with other beliefs, beliefs with desires, beliefs and desires with actions, fears with actions, and so on and so on. In other words, all the machinery of folk psychology um, if there is a true theory of that sort, then to whatever extent a qualified or perhaps a refined version of L3 seems plausible, um, a second order analog of it seems equally plausible. 
namely this. And notice that here we move to second order quantification. Right? For any x and for any um, properties, f and g, if x believes that f a and x believes that for any y, if f y, then g y, then barring confusion, distraction, et cetera, x believes that g a. Now, again, I don't claim that L3 star is, is true or even plausible, um, but I do claim that it inherits whatever appearance of plausibility um, L3 itself has. Okay, examples of this sort can, can easily be multiplied. And the upshot is uh, that it's plausible that if there's a true folk, folk psychological theory, it's going to have to quantify over all properties as L3 star does, uh, given the nomic conception of naturalness. In other words, C1 is plausible. Okay. Hold on just a second. So I am getting an alert from my computer. I'm running my computer um, on the battery because I've got it across the office from my desk. And I'm getting an alert that my battery is about to be dead. And I don't know why that would be. Can we take a, a 30 second break while I pl plug in my computer? Sorry about that. All right. Um, so let me, before we get to that. All right. Um, so I claim that um, if there is a true psychological theory that makes use of the psychological emotions, in particular the propositional attitudes, then all proper both, for example. Um, so to take the example from uh, L3 star, you know, if I uh, uh, believe that something is a backup hoe, uh, and I believe that uh, if it's a backup hoe, then it's either uh, edible or awful, then um, barring confusion, distraction, and so on, I will believe that it is either edible or awful. <laughs> okay. Um, now, um, I should say that there are uh, a couple of other takes on the nomic conceptions of natural properties. A former colleague of mine, Peter Valentine, has a slightly different conception that he calls the nomic joints account. But it's still based on the idea that the um, natural properties are those that figure in the uh, laws of nature, whatever those laws happen to be. Sometimes it's put in terms of the idea that um, uh, natural properties are those invoked by ideal science, right? Um, it goes along with this view, by the way, most distinctivists, as I've called them, uh, most of them are admirably modest about claiming to know whether a particular candidate is or is not a natural property. Um, a lot of them say we actually don't have any idea what properties are natural right now. Um, and the only way we'll find out is if we ever get to a completed science or something like that to ideal science. Um, Nevertheless, none of them is willing to countenance something like being a backupo <laughs> as a possible natural property, right? Uh, and the reason is this, they say, look, even though we don't know what a completed science will look like, we know perfectly well that the laws of nature are not gonna appeal to things like being a backupo, right? Which after all is this intuitively disjunctive property of being either a kakapo or a banjo or a potato. Um, now, what I'm claiming is this, that view can be plausible only if we're confident that there can't be true folk psychological laws, because it looks as though if there are true folk psychological laws, then it's plausible, we can't say for sure without knowing what they look like, but it's plausible that they would have to quantify over all properties, including peculiar ones like property of being a backup book. Okay. So, so much for the first premise, right? Which I claim is plausible. The first premise of the core argument. Remember the first premise of the core argument was just the claim that um, if 
there's a true psychological theory, then all properties are natural. Um, now we need to talk about the second premise as well, but before I do that, let's uh, look at some objections to the first premise, okay? Uh, sorry, objections to my claim, which is that the first premise is plausible. And sure I can... okay. So, um, uh, here's an objection. L3 star and L3 are stated in a kind of creolized logician's English version of second order logic. Regimenting them into non-creolized versions, which we would need to do to apply Ramsey's test is a daunting and controversy laden task to which I say it sure is, right? Um, there are notorious problems about quantifying into um, propositional attitude contexts. There is a famous paper by Quine called Quantifying In, in which he discussed some of these problems at great length. Um, so I don't deny that there are huge problems here about the correct way to represent um, these, uh, these candidates for law-like um, generalizations about folk psychology into the standard uh, resources of first or even second order logic, huge difficulties. Um, now, does, is that a problem? Well, you can only apply Ramsey's test once you've got something that's stated in second order logic, right? Um, and we don't know how to state these things in second order logic. So why would I claim that uh, any plausible casting of them into second order logic would give us this result? Um, well, I think that this claim is true, right? Um, that there are huge difficulties about trying to figure out how in the world to quantify into contexts like this. Uh, we can rehearse some of those if you're interested in the discussion, but I, I suspect a lot of people are familiar with them. Um, but the apparent need to quantify over at least every property we can think of is a datum that any theory of belief sentences must accommodate. And it's unlikely that it can accommodate it without retaining such quantification. So consider this. Um, if Fiona believes that the former president is an obese person, and Fiona believes that all obese people are hypertensive, and Fiona attends to these two beliefs, then barring confusion, distraction, annihilation, and so on, uh, Fiona will believe that the former president is hypertensive. And again, I'm not claiming that this is true, only that it's a candidate for something that uh, could be revised or perhaps qualified with a ceteris paribus condition into something that might uh, be developable into a folk psychological law. Consider instance two. If Gordon believes that the oldest violin is a Stradivarius and Gordon believes that all Stradivarius violins are costly and Gordon attends to these two beliefs, then barring confusion, distraction, annihilation, and so on, Gordon will believe that the oldest violin is costly. Instance three. If Hector believes that the oldest bakapo in New Zealand is less than 60 years old, and Hector believes that all things less than 60 years old are younger than the oldest digital computer, and Hector attends to these two beliefs, then barring confusion, distraction, annihilation, and so on, Hector will believe that the oldest bakapo in New Zealand is younger than the oldest digital computer, right? Now, all of these seem like perfectly intelligible claims of uh, folk psychological relations, and here's an obvious generalization. This is just taken straight out of those three instances, right? For any person S and properties F and G, if S believes, notice by the way that I got rid of the individual constants here to avoid the problem about quantifying in when you have individual constants which aren't easily represented, um, uh, don't easily correspond to any of our normal ways of talking about um, uh, propositional beliefs. Uh, for any person S and properties F and G, if S believes that the F is a G and S believes that all Gs are Hs and S attends to these two beliefs, then barring confusion, distraction, annihilation, and so on, S will believe that the F is a G. Now, I take it that um, there is no um, conceptual bar to say, thinking that this or more likely a suitable refinement, revision, or qualification of it could express a true folk psychological law. Well, if it could, then either there's a way of regimenting this into second order logic that will involve quantifying overall properties, 
or there isn't. If there isn't, it seems to me the correct thing to say is so much the worse for Ramsey's test. <laughs> in other words, if there are laws that are not amenable to being uh, stated in a way that we can then apply Ramsey's test to, then uh, that would tell us that we've got the wrong criterion for naturalness here. Right? If the underlying idea is that it's the laws of nature that determine um, which properties are natural. Um, I see that we're running short on time, so I'm going to skip a bit here. Okay. Um, here's another objection. Let's move on to the second premise of the core argument, which is simply that there is a true folk psychological theory. Now, what I want to say about C2 is different from what I said about C1. What I said about C1 is that it's overwhelmingly plausible that it's true. In other words, that if there's a true folk psychological theory, then all properties are natural. I don't claim that C2 is overwhelmingly plausible. <laughs> I have no idea whether there's a true folk psychological theory. Um, my claim is only that it is not implausible, right? So M here is not just doing negation. Otherwise, I would be contradicting myself. Um, uh, it's like uh, saying to say that an action is involuntary is not just saying it is not voluntary, right? Um, similarly, to say that something is not implausible is not, you don't, you can't cancel out double negations and say that it means it's plausible. Um, my basis for this claim is simply that all the arguments for its implausibility with which I'm familiar fail. And they're now generally recognized as failing. Um, and accordingly, I'm gonna give them pretty short shrift, but I think it'd be interesting to go through them. These are, these are all pretty old arguments from our perspective now. Um, what's interesting, there was this period in the 80s and 90s when folk psychology was sort of under attack from philosophers and that's just gone away, right? Um, almost nobody uh, challenges the, um, at least the possibility that, um, and the epistemic possibility that we do in fact believe things and desire things and fear things. And in fact, if anything, the category of folk psychological uh, properties has expanded, uh, not contracted. Um, but here are three arguments against C2. There's Davidson's argument against strict deterministic psychological or psychophysical laws. Um, so again, I said, I'm gonna give these things short shrift. So here's the short shrift, uh, two things to say. One is that that argument of Davidson's um, is I think generally recognized now as unsuccessful for reasons that we can discuss later if you want. But more importantly, I'd say this, um, even if it succeeds, um, we don't get from this to a rebuttal of MCN unless we take it that laws of nature must be strict deterministic laws. But if we say that laws of nature must be strict deterministic laws, then uh, that means that we rule out as um, even approximations of laws of nature of all contemporary scientific so-called laws, including those of physics, which are typically not strict and deterministic, and certainly all of the special sciences. Um, so it would be odd to have a criterion for, um, for lawhood or for ideal science, which this is supposed to dovetail with, that makes it out that uh, nothing we currently recognize as science is science at all. Okay, I said short drift, short drift given. Um, libertarian arguments from free will. Uh, I have in mind here an old argument from Roderick Chisholm. Uh, he says there cannot be a science of man. This is because of his view of imminent causation, right? Where you can, the agent can simply cause something in a way that's not causally determined by prior states and events. So like a lot of people, I'm very skeptical of the notion of imminent causation, but that doesn't really matter here. We can just give him that for the sake of argument. Um, even if Chisholm's arguments are true, um, all that they establish, I mean, the most that they establish is that there can't be deterministic psychological or psychophysical laws covering all human psychological states and actions. Fair enough. But of course, that still leaves it open that there could be non-deterministic laws governing 
all psychological or uh, psychophysical interactions. Um, and it also allows for the possibility that there could even be strict deterministic laws that govern some proper subset of the psychological domain. So um, again, although I think that Chisholm's argument probably doesn't succeed in its own terms, even if it succeeds in its own terms, it doesn't show that there couldn't be a true folk psychological theory. Um, eliminativism about propositional attitudes. Well, I mentioned this, this was the view that had its heyday in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and the idea here is this, that if you think about uh, uh, terms like belief, desire, fear, and so on, all the propositional attitude terms, um, according to um, this eliminativist view, those are theoretical terms that get their meaning only from the theory in which they're embedded. And so if the theory turns out to be false, then the terms themselves don't apply to anything, okay? So if, um, if this folk psychological theory that we're all supposed to be implicitly committed to turns out to be false, then there simply wouldn't be any beliefs because the uh, notion of belief only gets its content from the theory in which it's embedded and it only has application if that theory turns out to be true. Now, uh, I've already said, I'm skeptical of the idea that there is in fact any folk psychological theory to which we're all implicitly committed, at least that we are aware that we're all implicitly committed to. Um, so there's one reason for skepticism. Um, perhaps, this seems to me a far-fetched claim, but perhaps we could say, no, these are theoretical terms and they get their meaning from a theory um, that we are in some sense implicitly committed to, even though we are unaware of our commitment and when confronted with it would strenuously deny it, okay? Well, it seems a little bit peculiar to say that the meanings of our terms are derived from theories that we um, uh, take ourselves explicitly to reject, but, but again, I'm always in favor of being as concessive as possible. <laughs> so uh, let's concede that point, right? If we concede that point, then what does the claim come to? It comes to this. If there's no true folk psychological theory, then um, beliefs uh, and desires and fears and the other propositional attitudes don't exist, okay? Okay, fair enough, I suppose that's true for the sake of argument. Uh, and then it's supposed to follow from that, of course, that there's no true, there couldn't be a true folk psychological theory. But now wait a minute, what's the argument? The argument is um, there's no true folk psychological theory, therefore the notions of belief, desire, and so on have no content, which means there are no beliefs, desires, and so on. Therefore, there's no, no true folk psychological theory. <laughs> well, that's the definition of a circular argument. You could look that up in the philosophical dictionary and that would be the definition, that argument, right? Because its premise, its first premise is there's no true folk psychological theory. And then it goes from that to the claim that beliefs, desires and so on don't exist. And then it goes from that to the claim that there's no true folk psychological theory. Well, okay. Um, uh, that argument has the um, uh, virtue of validity like most circular arguments do, um, but uh, it does seem to me that it has nothing to recommend it. It's just taking for granted what it's supposed to be shown. All right. Um, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'll stop because I know we're short on time. Um, so I've argued that uh, the first premise of the core argument is, is very plausible. The second one I'm agnostic about, but it's at least not especially implausible. Um, and therefore, I claim, given that the argument is clearly valid, there's no reason to think that the um, uh, conclusion is uh, false, and the conclusion being that all properties are natural. Um, now, somebody might argue this way. They might say, okay, grant what you say about the plausibility of C1 and C2, but even if neither of them is implausible, their conjunction could still be, right? because plausibility is not closed under conjunction. And let me say uh, right off the bat that of course, that's right. 
it's not closed under conjunction. I'm the first to uh, agree with that. Um, an example I give is this, suppose I, uh, I have a handsaw. I should have brought a handsaw for a visual aid. I have a handsaw and uh, consider the claim that the number of teeth on my handsaw is even. I haven't counted them and it's got lots and lots of teeth. You can't just tell, but I can't just tell by looking at it what the number is. Is it plausible that it's got an even number of teeth? No, no not especially. Um, is it plausible that it has an odd number of teeth? No, not especially. Can we then conjoin these and say, therefore it's plausible that it has neither an odd nor an even number of teeth? Well, no, of course not, right? Um, that's extremely implausible. So yes, implausibility is not closed under conjunction. Um, uh, another way to, to illustrate this is in terms of credences. I will go on the record as saying that I'm not a fan of credences. I'm very skeptical about credences as understood in the Bayesian way. But again, one thing at a time. So I'm going to set my reservations aside and talk in terms of credences. Right? Suppose we just, let's just pick a number out of the air and let's say that something qualifies as implausible for me um, if it's got a credence of uh, uh, less than 0.4. Okay, I'm just making up numbers. I do that a lot. Uh, a credence of less than 0.4. And then um, take two claims that each have a credence, independent claims, right? That each have a credence of 0.6. So each of them is, um, is uh, plausible or at least not um, non-implausible, right? And yet their conjunction is gonna have a credence of 0.6 times 0.6, which is 0.36, which is below our threshold of 0.4. So we have two um, uh, conjuncts, neither of which is implausible, and yet their conjunction is implausible, okay? So yes, I, I'm, I'm just taking a long time to say that I admit the abstract point, but I'm not relying on just the abstract point, right? Um, or I'm not evading the abstract point. Um, the reason is this, my claim about um, C1 is that it's not just plausible, it's immensely plausible. It's hard to see how it could be wrong. If you wanna put it in terms of credences, I'd say it's got a credence of 0.95 or maybe 0.99 or something like that. I don't say that about C2, Right, that might be 0.5 or 0.4, I don't know. But the point is this, if, you, if it's somewhere in the middle there, if it's like 0.5 and credence in C1 is 0.99, well then um, you're still gonna get um, a credence that's gonna turn out to be above our threshold of implausibility. But here's the, that's a kind of, kind of way of responding to this objection that's just focused on the math. But I think the more interesting way of responding to the objection is to look at the motivation behind it, right? Why would you think that this conjunction is implausible? As far as I can see, the only reason you would have to think that is that <clears throat> you're already convinced that not all properties are natural. In other words, you want to reject the conclusion of the argument. And so, um, you say, well, I want to reject the conclusion of the argument. Therefore, I should dig in my heels and say that even though neither conjunct itself is implausible, um, their conjunction must be, right? But notice what you're doing there. You're letting prior intuitions about which properties count as natural and which ones don't guide your judgments about the uh, plausibility or implausibilities of these other things that seem to be completely uh, independent of any such judgment. So in other words, you're letting intuitions about naturalness guide your view about how the empirical science is gonna go. And that seems to me to, to be a, a dangerous kind of a priorism, it's putting the cart before the horse, right? The whole point of the um, gnomic conception of natural properties is that we're supposed to be epistemically modest and let the deliverances of science tell us which properties are natural. If you take this route, um, what you're doing instead is you're saying, no, we're letting prior intuitions about what's natural constrain our views about how science could go. And that seems to me uh, a bad move, okay? Well, there's a whole lot more um, to say. I could back up and look at some of these other objections that I haven't talked about. And uh, one thing I haven't talked about at all 
is, um, is the move of um, trying to recast the gnomic conception to simply avoid my argument, right? right? Not to rebut the argument, but to simply avoid it. Uh, and to do so by restricting the kind of quantification that's suitable um, for building your Ramsey sentence, right? So in other words, instead of saying that uh, a property counts as natural, essentially if it's quantified over in the laws of nature, instead of that, uh, say, no, to be natural, it's got to satisfy that condition, but it also has to be the case that it's quantified over, at least in one context, in which it doesn't appear within a propositional attitude verb, uh, the scope of a propositional attitude verb, right? So the idea is it's only going to be natural if it does some gnomic work outside of propositional attitudes, right? So um, that's one possibility. There are at least two other uh, candidates for trying to change the scope of quantification to avoid my argument. If you want to talk about those in discussion, we can do so. But anyway, you've got the argument. Uh, and you've got some of my 27 objections. And so maybe I will uh, call things to a halt there. Thanks. Thanks so much to Professor Jean Mills. We're very grateful. Next up, Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question, please make yourselves known by any means available. Um, you can... Uh, uh, jump in directly. We have a first question from Dr. Kovach. Uh, David is a, is a good friend. He's now um, in um, uh, Israel, but he finished a PhD in, uh, Cornell, uh, in Cornell. David, please go ahead. Thank you. I just feel bad about being the first person to ask a question because I'm, I'm an outsider. So I, I waited a few seconds. Uh, thanks for his talk. It was super interesting. Um, very provocative in the good way. Um, so I um, so I wanted to ask you a bit more about uh, how exactly you're thinking about the ontological commitments of theories. Um, so maybe, maybe I can give you an analogy um, to tell you what was bugging me about the first premise of the argument. So forget, forget for a moment about second order quantification and just think of like very simple textbook laws of nature, which are probably not real laws of nature, but you know, philosophers laws of nature, like st stuff like um, every, I don't know, every wolf is a predator, something like that. Every wolf is a predator. So here's a question. And uh, this is a little bit about Quine interpretation or, or how contemporary Quineans think about ontological commitment. But, but here's a question. What exactly are the ontological commitments of this law? Um, so here are two possible. So suppose Fido is a wolf. So suppose Fido is one particular wolf. So one, one answer to this question is the ontological commitments of this law are just wolves. The, the law confers commitment to wolves. Another possible answer is the law confers commitment to Fido and to, you know, Guido and, you know, to each particular instance of the kind wolf. So, so I, um, I would favor the, the first response. I, I think the law confers commitment to wolves. It applies to Fido, but I wouldn't say that Fido is one of the ontological commitments of the law. So you know you might you might think this is controversial, but because I think this, I'm also worried about the analogous kind of argument in the second order place because you know the um, the second order quantifiers in question, uh, I mean they quantify over they quantify over properties. So the question I would ask is, are the um, What's the ontological commitment of these sec of these laws that use second order quantifiers? Are they properties, or are they the are the instances of the kind property? This is a slightly clumsy way of putting it, and, and I would say that a very natural reaction to this argument is that yeah, I th I think that your point about psychological you know folk psychological laws shows that there is um, 
there is a natural property which we haven't thought of, which is the property of being a property or, or, some, or the property of falling under a concept. And that, that's an interesting point. It, it's, inter it's, 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 a non, it's a non obvious thing to be told that the property of falling under a concept is a natural property. Does it follow that each uh, instance of falling under a concept is a natural property? I, would, I think I would want to resist that move. Okay. Um, Good. That's a that's a wonderful question, um, and I think that for my purposes, I can uh, I can be uh, agnostic on an answer for the following reason. Um, first of all, let me let me take your example. You know, there is a wolf and it's a predator. Now, um, or all wolves are predators, something like that. Um, there are also gonna be, um, I mean, probably biologists actually do invoke uh, laws concerning predator-prey relations, right? Where they say, if, you know, in a given ecosystem, if the population of predators increases then the population of prey decreases, up, you know, up to a certain point, and then you get the sine curve going back and forth. Um, so um, the reason I can be agnostic is simply this. If we take your account, right, then of course we're going to, uh, unless we're going to try and uh, somehow come up with a principal difference between psychology and everything else, um, then presumably we should use that same account for all the sciences, right? So for mass properties and things like that, right? Uh, if we're doing physics, uh, for example. Um, so if we're prepared to say, well, look, if we say that something has a mass of four kilograms, um, then what we're really doing, let me see if I've got this right, is we're saying that there is a natural, the, the property of uh, being a mass property, right? Is that the right analogy here? But there is no property of having a, a mass of four kilograms. I think I've got the, the structure the same here, right? Well, then all of those properties that physicists appeal to are going to go by the board as well. Now, you might just be prepared to accept that and say that the only natural properties are these kind of second order properties, properties of being properties or something like that. But the other thing I would say is this, look, if there is such a thing as the property of being a property, what are its instances? Aren't they properties? Isn't that just what it means to say that something is a property of being a property, that the instances of that property are themselves properties? Now, I'll let you come back. Let me say one more thing. Um, there is a, a, a movement afoot these days to say that, look, quantification by itself gives you no existential um, ontological commitment at all. Uh, Jim Cargill's colleague, Ross Cameron, has a paper on this where he says that second order quantification uh, doesn't commit you to properties, even if you're quantifying over them, right? Um, now, I'm, I'm prepared to say, look, uh, again, you know, everywhere you look in philosophy, there are battles to be fought. And my aim is to run away from them as many as possible. So I'm not sure that I agree with Cameron about that, but, but for my purposes, all I have to say is this, look, if that's right, that's fine. But then the gnomic conception of natural properties goes away. It's just gone, right? Because all the people who champion it, Armstrong, Sider, Lewis, Meller, and so on, Keefe, they're all saying that, look, the natural properties just are the ones that are quantified over, right? Once you've got the laws of nature stated. So to say, aha, quantification over these things doesn't actually give you ontological commitment. I say, fine, that's, that's fine. But then you can't say that's what natural properties are unless you're just prepared to take that as a reductio and say there are no natural properties at all. Okay, does, I think that sort of gets to your point, doesn't it? Maybe I've misunderstood it completely. No, no, no. I, um, to, yeah. So, Andre, can I just respond briefly? I, 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 you know, I don't wanna, don't wanna hold, hold up the line if there are questions. So, um, so I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to make any assumption about uh, the ontological committalness of second order quantifiers. I, um, um, I, I was, I, I was hoping to just roll with what I thought you were assuming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The um, I'm I'm sorry that I'm, I'm sorry. Can, can you close it? 
Sorry it's about a, that. A nice breath of humanity. I like kids, it. kids, you know, kiddo is in the background. So, um, um, so yeah, so, so I wasn't, I wasn't trying to make any, I, I was kind of just as, assuming that they are ontological committal. Uh, um, um, but um, so I, I think mass is a really tricky example. I think mass is just a really special case and a tricky example. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to think about mass properties, something like, uh, um, uh, I, I don't know, that's like a huge topic of its own, how to construct mass properties from the unit mass. So, so maybe I would maybe I would put that to the side. I, I, I guess for me, the real test would be, so think of a psychological property, like uh, think think of like any any value of the X in those second second order quantified cases, something like um, um, uh, I don't know if, uh, if, I, if 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 I believe that uh, um, I don't know um, Napoleon lived more than two hundred years ago, uh, then I believe that somebody lived more than two hundred years ago. Um, so, is there also a psychological law where? Um, the property of uh, having lived more than 200 years ago is not just a value of, of a quantifier, but it, it appears as, uh, as, 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 as an unbound predicate, where it just appears. So it, I'm not sure what, what's a better way to put it, but is, is there a, I just sorry, the is, you said it appears as a what predicate? Like like a predicate that is not bound by a quantifier, just 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 as a sentence that would also be well formed in first order logic. Is there a psychological law where it also appears in that way? Uh, you know, in the uh, um, in in the in the predator case, um, um, there are laws about predators, but there are also laws about wolves. Yeah. Uh, so wolf is is a bona fide natural kind. Um, you know, it's also true that um, dogs, I don't know, wolves older than 10 years and bears younger than 12 years are predators, but there are no laws that use the predicate being a wolf older than 10 years or being a bear younger than 12 years, even though the, even though the set of those things fall under the predicate, is a, those things are predators. Um, so I, I feel like I'm just uh, rambling, but... Um, um, that's, like, that's, I, I think we're yeah. having. I think we're 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 in the familiar philosophical position of trying really hard to understand each other and not quite getting there. Um, so it seems to me that there are um, things that at least biologists would call laws. Um, maybe they don't come up to the philosophical standard, right? Um, uh, that involve the property of being a wolf, right? So, so it's a law that all wolves have X number of chromosomes, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever that may be. So um, that seems to um, involve a property of being a wolf and a property of having X number of chromosomes, right? Because the claim is for any X, if X is, a, if WX, then CX, mm -hmm. right? Okay, okay. Right? Does that, that seems right, yeah. Yeah. So the idea that that we're quantifying over the wolves but not over these properties, that just seems to me mistaken, right? We are quantifying over the properties. The question is uh, exactly how, how to bridge, so how to make an inference from what we are quantifying over to, well, you know, you don't have to call it ontological commitments, but, but the things that, um, um, the, the, the things that are bearers of the things that fall under the natural and predicate, let's put it that this way. You know, I put it in terms of ontological commitment. That's right. the inference that isn't obvious to me. It's not obvious to me that just because a theory needs to quantify over Fs, uh -huh. any any value, anything that falls under F is itself a natural entity. Uh, or or that it's it's among the ontological slash ideological commitments of the theory. That's that's what wasn't obvious to me. I, I feel like I'm just repeating myself, but you know, the theory is committed to wolves. It's not committed to Fido. Uh, likewise, the theory I is agree. committed to properties. It's not committed to this particular property. It just applies okay. to it. Yeah. So look, um, suppose there's a true folk psychological theory and it includes a law like the one I call the L3. Um, um, 
that, that theory isn't going to com- isn't committed to the existence of any particular beliefs, right? Right. It's not right. committed to the view that anybody believes that two plus two is four. Right. Right. right? But it is committed, um, it seems, to the existence of a belief relation. Right. I agree. Right? Because right. that's what's getting quantified over, right? So right. If, if X stands in the belief relation to P, then blah, 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 blah. Right, right. right. Okay, so um, that's, um, I, I th- okay, good. I think your, your view is now coming into focus. So the idea is that the belief, on this view, the belief relation will be a natural relation, a two-place uh, property or something like yes, that. Yes, and that doesn't seem like such a bad consequence. That was the idea. That that seems okay. Like, you know, if it turns out that all of those values of, you know, your propositional quantifiers and every single one of those values of, of, of that second order quantifier, all of those things are natural, that would be a very bad outcome. If belief is a natural kind, that seems okay to me. Okay, good. Um, I, I like this. Uh, I need to think about it, but I, I do still have this worry. Um, you said you wanted to set aside the case of mass. Uh, that seems a good idea to set it aside, but I do think that the same worry about mass is going to come up anywhere you have a relation to numbers, right? Anytime you have a scalar quantity, because if you want to talk about mass or you want to talk about acceleration, um, or for that matter, you just want to talk about uh, cardinality of a wolf population in a certain area, right? These are all going to be expressed, presumably, in terms of um, a relation between uh, a property and a number, right? So with mass, we say, well, there are mass properties, but of course, there are particular mass properties, the property of having a mass of four kilograms, which is presumably a, a, a suitable relation between the object that has mass, whatever that may be, and uh, the real numbers or some appropriate subset of the real numbers, right? So, um, and similarly, if you're talking about population, population of wolves in Yellowstone Park, um, presumably you can express that as a relation between the uh, property of being a wolf, right? Uh, and And a certain real number. Yeah, I mean, me, me, so yeah. I mean, numbers are involved. You can have yeah. the same same problems as you have with mass. So it seems to me that if you want to set mass aside and say, well, I don't want to talk about that, um, you're going to have to set aside all of these properties that are normally given a a scalar quantity, right? Because they're all going to have the same feature, and that means that none of those can be natural properties. J- j- no. Just the last. Sorry, just the last question. I just wanted to ask if that's a problem, though. Why do you need intentional context for that? Aren't there, like, could it, could it, like, oh, I don't know. I aren't there know. laws which don't feature intentional intentional context, and you have the same issue with scalar properties? Well, um, so look, I don't think it's a problem because I think those are all okay. natural properties, and interestingly, so does David Armstrong, right? Mm. So, um, I mean, Armstrong talks about this very explicitly. He thinks that. You know, for any number n, there is a natural, there's a property in his view, a natural property of having a mass of n, you know, where that's in some appropriate, yeah, 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 yeah. appropriate units and, and kilograms or whatever it may be. Um, and he thinks that's true, even if there is nothing uh, in the universe that actually instantiates that property. He thinks that, you know, the mass properties come as a family. That's his view. So right, he, right. So he wants to say, look, yeah, um, there is such a thing as having a mass property, but there's also the thing, such a thing as having a property of having a mass of four kilograms, even if nothing in the world has ever had a mass of four kilograms, right? So, um, and I, I think that view is actually shared by everybody who takes the nomic conception. They're all happy to say that there can be um, uninstantiated mass properties, right? And you know, I think what's in the background is this. They think that being a mass property is itself a natural kind, right? And so all of the properties that fall under it are themselves going to end up being uh, natural. Now, um, again, you know, my inclination is to say, look, I'm not trying, I'm not defending a view about naturalness. I don't have a view about naturalness. All the people who defend the nomic conception of naturalness, I think they would take your point. And just say, yeah, that's right. Um, just you know, if if we're going to accept that there that every single number corresponds to a, a separate mass property, which is a natural property, right? Then mm-hmm. why not say that every 
belief property, you know, believing that the sky is blue corresponds to a separate property, which is itself a natural property. It seems mm -hmm. to me they're just completely parallel. Thank you. Thank you so much for that to, to both of you. Wonderful exchange. Um, some more questions, comments, rejoinders, objections. Jim, please go ahead. Professor James Carter, we're listening. I'm afraid you're muted. So now, am I am I audible? Yes. Uh, now, I uh, assume that you are expressing skepticism about uh, the claim that there's a distinction between natural and non-natural properties. Yes, in the sense that I think there's no good basis for drawing that distinction. Yes. I don't deny that there's a distinction. I'm just saying we have no good basis for drawing it. Yeah. And, and wouldn't Meller and Armstrong agree Now, why is that? They would agree because they take this view, as I said earlier, that um, things like being a bacopo is, is not a non-natural property. It's just not a property at all, right? Yes. Um, so in that sense, they would agree. They'd say, yes, all properties. So all properties are natural can be read in two different ways. Uh, in the Armstrong way, um, it just says, look, there are very few properties. <laughs> they are sparse, as, as uh, he puts it. Uh, they're the ones that do all those things that were that natural mm -hmm. properties were supposed to do that I outlined at the beginning. And these other things, like being a backup, that's not a property at all. Now, it's interesting, you know, Armstrong says, um, uh, and this is a, almost a direct quote. I've read it many times. He says, of course, there is a sense in which, and that's italicized. I don't know if you can hear the italics in my voice. There is a sense in which whenever uh, we truly apply a predicate to a thing, um, there is a property that we are attributing with the use of the predicate. He says that, but the there is a sense in which uh, is taken, and he's very clear about this. He says, it's not a sense that carries ontological commitment, right? Okay, so, um, I say, that's fine, <laughs> um, Armstrong and Meller and people who take that line. Uh, I can recast my argument in terms friendly to yours. Take this weak sense that doesn't carry on ontological commitment, right? The weak sense in which there is a property. And my argument is this, that uh, whatever properties exist in your weak sense of there are such properties, um, I'm arguing there's no reason to think that those aren't properties in your sense, right? Yes. Good. And yes. it seems that uh, some people think that logical compounds of properties don't qualify because they wouldn't be natural. Right, they don't qualify as natural because they wouldn't be natural. That's interesting explanation. Well, they, 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 they have to give reasons. Yeah. But they would have the intuition that the compound wasn't a natural property so that you, you have Armstrong denying that properties are closed under the truth functional operations. Sure. But if uh, you take the nomic conception, then, uh, Every theorem of a, the, the ultimate Ramsey theory would uh, represent properties. And, and, and the, uh, so the question would be whether the ultimate Ramsey logic is governed by the usual rules for truth functional operations. And if it is, then it would seem that that Armstrong position wasn't coherent. Because exactly. if you were simply, hmm? if you're simply, oh, denying, if you're simply denying that certain compounds qualify as properties at all, right? You're going to encounter the fact that if you accept the components, the logic involved in the Ramsey sentence is going to commit you to the compounds, 
And uh, so it, it, it seems that you would have to have uh, odd, be at odds with the standard logical treatment of the Ramsey sentence. I agree with that. So that's, that's fine. Um, so again, as I've said, you know, there are infinitely many battles. What you're suggesting, Jim, is simply a direct assault on Armstrong's conception <laughs> of a property. I'm trying to be concessive <laughs> and say, look, suppose that we can make sense of his account um, and we adopt his criterion for what counts as a property, then by his own lights, it looks as though he's gonna have to count what I'm calling all properties or what he would call all uh, weakly understood properties as properties. And yeah. that claim is certainly one that he would be hostile to, he wouldn't welcome it, but it's yeah. not charging him with an outright contradiction in his, in his theory, right? Which is what you're doing. So you're just more of a bulldog than I am. <laughs> you're, you're trying to, you're going for the throat, whereas I'm just trying to sort of remove the dirt from under where he's standing. <laughs> Does that sound right? Thank you, yes, okay. yes. Thanks so much to both. There's some more comments, rejoinders, questions, objections. If not, I have uh, two questions of my own. Uh, sure. And uh, I'll ask the first, the, 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 the the, the, the more interesting one is sillier, I think. And so I'll stop the recording before asking it. Uh, but uh, the, the, the first one seems more uh, academically kosher. And so I'll ask it anyway. Um, you start by telling us the job that natural properties are supposed to do. And you end by suggesting that a natural, non-natural distinction uh, doesn't have a good basis uh, to be drawn on. And so naturally, unintended, the, 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 yeah, yeah, the, the, the question's gonna be, well, what if you tinkered with the job that natural properties are supposed to do? Would different specifications of naturalness deliver different verdicts or is there any kind of circularity here and if so is it virtuous yeah good that's a great question so what i think is um first of all let me uh let me share my screen again and just scroll back to that list of things that natural properties are supposed to do um Here we go. Um, so here's, here's what I think. I think that um, this list of things that natural properties are supposed to do, what I think is that um, some of these are uh, things that do genuinely, oops, genuinely require um, something that explains them. Um, and some of them don't. So some of them I think are just um, illusory questions. But even of the ones that I think do require explanation, um, I don't see any reason to think that there must be a single way of carving up properties that's gonna give you the uh, same underlying explanation for all of these different things, okay? Now, um, so, I'll, I'll talk about some of these specific things in a second, but let me make a general point too. Remember, I started off the talk by saying, look, there's undeniably some sense in which some properties are natural and some are not. I don't, right? I just deny that it's a metaphysically deep sense, right? I think it's a, a, it's a psychological sense that we are so constructed psychologically that we incline to group things in certain ways and not in others, that we incline to draw certain distinctions and not in others. So there certainly is a sort of psychological sense of naturalness in which I think there's an interesting distinction between the natural and the non-natural. 
Um, but when I say that it's not metaphysically substantive, I, what I mean is this, I think it's just a feature of the way we happen to, the kinds of cognizers and so on that we happen to be. And that other cognizers could easily carve things up differently. And ours way of carving things up has no, um, uh, you know, right of precedence over other ways of doing it. Um, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, now, one thing that's interesting to me is that distinctivists, the people that I'm calling those who have this commitment to a sort of deep metaphysical distinction, I think that they're exhibiting um, and the kind of a priorism that historically has given philosophy a bad name. <laughs> that is, trying to take facts about uh, our psychology and somehow think that these are expressing deep truths about the world, um, right? Whereas I, I mean, I, in this way, I'm, I'm a naturalist, not in, not in the way that word is sometimes used, but I think that they're not giving adequate respect to the role of empirical science. So um, metaphysically natural properties are supposed to serve as reference magnets and to determine the extension of their corresponding kind terms, whereas non-natural properties do need it. So let's look at that. I started off with the example of the dog, right? Now, um, I've been focusing here on the categorical distinction between natural and non-natural properties, but um, a lot of people also talk about a graded notion where some properties are more natural than others, where to be nor more natural is to be closer to being categorically natural, right? So I don't know anybody who says that the property of being a dog is in fact a natural property, right? In the metaphysical sense. But they'd say, well, it's, it's certainly a better candidate for one, or it's closer to being one than being a backup pony. But um, if it's not actually a natural property, then of course, it's not a reference magnet um, in this case, right? Because non-natural properties are not reference magnets. And yet, here's the thing. What does it mean to be a reference magnet? The idea is this, that you know, we learn a term as applied to, say, one thing. And somehow or another, we're able to see that that term applies to a much broader class of things than the one that we initially learned it with respect to. And the idea is that's because what we're doing is we're fastening on to a natural kind. That's what determines the reference of our term, right? Whereas if it's a non-natural kind, there's nothing to fasten onto there, okay? But look, look with dog, uh, it looks like we do have a reference magnet for the term dog. Um, I'm not one of those people who thinks there's a tremendous amount to be learned by looking at childhood language acquisition. That's a philosophical interest. It's a great psychological interest. But but think about this, you know, when a child is learning how to use the word dog, they'll see two or three different dogs. One's a Great Dane, one's a Schnauzer, and one's a Golden Retriever. And then, you know, and sometimes they'll make mistakes when they then encounter new dogs. They'll call a cat a dog or something like that. But that period actually doesn't last very long. It takes almost no time at all before, boom, they glom on, they've got it. And all of a sudden they can correctly apply the term dog to new animals that they're encountering for the first time who bear no intuitive similarity to the dogs they've seen before, right? So there's something there that seems like it's a reference magnet, right? Something that's determining the extension of their use of the term that's not just sort of their could, could I perhaps just very briefly stop you there just to understand, um, um, I mean, I think other folks is, have used uh, reference magnetism besides Lewis. So uh, when you say to determine the extension, do you mean to correctly determine the extension? Mm -hmm. I see. Yes. Okay. So, um, and so is there any, I mean, Perhaps as a matter of brute fact in our cognitive development that happens, but is there any reason for why the fluency or the immediacy in determining the extension is an indication of correctness or accuracy? Um, fluency is not a, an indication of accuracy, but I'm taking the accuracy to be uh, something that looks more or less like a datum, right? We see that, oh yeah, the kid does learn how to correctly use the word dog, right? Uh, and learns it very quickly. Um, now, that is to say that the extension of their use of the term seems to be determined by something other than 
the sort of identifiable features of the members of that extension that they've been exposed to, right? So they can generalize beyond that. Yes, that's it. Right? Now, I take it that there's a, some psychological explanation for that, right? And I don't see why we can't understand reference magnets just in terms of psychology, right? <laughs> in terms of psychology. There could be other people who, um, when they see these two things, right? And then they see a, whoops. Technology is gonna be the death of me here. There we go. And then they see a potato, they say, aha, look, another Bacapo, <laughs> right? After they've just been shown the Banjo and the Kakapo. Now, you and I aren't built that way. Probably no human beings are, right? Um, I mean, we can stipulate these things, but we wouldn't naturally generalize in that way. But that seems to me a mere uh, accident of psychology, right? So I don't think that we need metaphysical naturalness to account for reference magnetism. All we need is psychology. Okay. Um, so so uh, that, sounds, that sounds right. Uh, I wouldn't say that, uh, I mean, I, I, I think that it's exactly right that we don't need one or the other, right? It's not to say that one isn't consistent with the other or harmonious or whatever. Um, yeah, and so um, now we've uh, stricken that down off the list, right? And so I'm assuming your plan is to do the same for the rest? Yes. Yeah, so again, the, it's not a uniform treatment. I mean, in some cases, um, I think that um, I think well, in some cases, I think that the claim involved is simply too unclear to be assessed. So my favorite one is the old one. You know, that comes from Plato. That uh, natural properties are the ones that carve nature at the joints. Um, I mean, I'm happy to say that. I just think that nature is jointed everywhere. <laughs> That's all. So uh, I'm happy to. Ex so I, I'm happy to say, look, if natural properties are the ones picked out by the gnomic conception, then I'm happy to accept that there are such things as natural properties, and they carve nature at the joints because there are joints everywhere, right? So I have no problem with that one. Um, as far as the ones uh, being relevant to causal powers, uh, I'm not so clear about this. Um, you know, I'm inclined here. Um, I keep I keep uh, accepting views of people that I'm in general disagreement with. Um, I <laughs> uh, I remember my old teacher Donald Davidson um, talking about uh, Nelson Goodman and the projectivism uh, the, the projectability of the term "grew," right? Saying that it's not amenable to uh, law-like statements. And Davidson said, "Look, um, there's no problem." with constructing laws involving grewness, right? It's true, it's not a law that all emeralds are grew. That's not a law. But it is true that all emeryers are grew, right? Where an emeryer is an object that is green if inspected before a certain time and blue if inspected afterwards, <laughs> right? He says, perfectly law-like relation there. He says, you know, it's, the problem is that these terms aren't made for each other, is the way he put it not that you can't construct laws using the term grew. And that seems in this case to be exactly right to me. And we can say the same thing about causal powers. It seems to me that um, being a backupo does confer causal powers on a thing. It's just that the uh, things that it uh, makes it uh, apt to cause or able to cause are themselves gonna be what psychologically seems like a diverse assortment of events, right? So that's the second one on the list. I've gone through three of them, not in order. Do we have time to go through every one of them? I'd, I'd be happy to, but I, I suspect you don't want to go that long. Um, I, I'm, I'm incredibly happy to go through all of them. Uh, there is another meeting I need to be in, but uh, that can wait. We can spend all night uh, uh, sort of going through them. Um, um, would you like to, is there anyone that sort of jumps to eye and you'd like to um, uh, sort of knock it down off the bat? Well, I, I'm especially interested in uh, problems of vagueness. 
I've I've thought and written about that. So the last one on the left, um, okay. does they resist vagueness in their corresponding kind terms in a way that their unnatural brethren do not? Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, well, I'll just be short with this. Uh, I have what is usually nowadays called an epistemic view of vagueness. Um, uh, I, that does not mean that I endorse the theories that usually are called epistemicism. Uh, I believe so do some other people in the meeting. Some other people that are on the screen right now. That's right. Okay. Um, even though some of those people staunchly deny it. Uh, and I'm using some here in the logician sense of at least one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd say this, look, take, um, take any meaningful claim right, um, that we think of as, as exemplifying vagueness. So take, you know, so-and-so is bald instead of someone who is a borderline case for baldness. Now, I don't wanna to be too simple-minded about this. I don't, I think that the term bald is highly context relative. I think you can express different things by it on different occasions of use. I don't think that there's any reason to think that even if you're going through a sorority sequence that you're necessarily expressing the same property with each successive utterance and so on. I think all of these things are, are uh, up for grabs, right? But I would say this, um, if you say, quote, so-and-so is bald, and you mean by that something that is as compatible as anything can be with its ordinary use in English, and you're saying it about a case that we would intuitively consider a case of a borderline case for baldness, I think that you're saying something that is true or false, but not both, and that we have no way of determining which one it is, right? Um, now, so I don't think that we need to appeal to natural kinds to resist vagueness. Now, maybe the idea is this, um, with respect to natural kind terms, there simply couldn't be any borderline cases. That is, there couldn't be borderline cases uh, for natural kind terms where we wouldn't know if, if we were ideally situated whether the thing applied. I think that's actually quite misguided. Now, here it's hard to argue by example because, again, we don't have any uncontroversial examples of actual natural properties. What we have are sort of you know, gestures in the direction that, well, certain things are more likely to be natural than others, but we won't know what are really the natural properties until science is finished, right? And we've got all the laws in all their glory. But, but take things like um, length properties. And, and you will sometimes say, hear people say, I mean, not just hear them say, but see them write, um, that, well, yes, lots of, lots of predicates are vague. They usually do it in terms of predicates rather than properties. But they say lots of predicates are vague, but some are not. For example, if I say that something is exactly 3.2 millimeters, that's precise, right? 3.2 millimeters long. Now, um, I think that precision uh, is itself a context relative thing, right? And what we mean by the word precise varies with context. And of course, you know, if, if you say, uh, how much do you weigh? And I say uh, 88 kilograms. I don't mean 88.0000000 kilograms. I mean something around there, right? And that might nevertheless qualify as precise. But I would say this, to say that something is 3.2 millimeters, if there is such a property as being 3.2 millimeters in length, then I think that it is sorites susceptible in the following sense. If you look at, um, I mean, how do you, what determines the reference of the term 3.2 millimeters long? Well, of course, nowadays they are redoing all of the fundamental uh, units of measurement in terms of universal constants, right? Physical constants. Um, that would, I think, take us too far afield. But so let me, con let me consider the, the old fashioned version that we're all familiar with from Kripke, okay? Suppose that we, uh, we go back to the days when the standard of the meter was this platinum bar in Paris, right? And uh, that was the thing that determined the reference of the term one meter. And what determined it was not the length of the bar, as you'll recall, but there were two extremely fine, microscopically fine scratches on the bar. And the meter was defined as the distance between those microscopically fine scratches, okay? Fine, very precise for purposes of carpentry, right? 
even for purposes of mechanical engineering. But if you look at those scratches under uh, an extremely powerful microscope, of course, you're going to see that they have jagged edges, right? And so the idea that, that the term one meter um, doesn't admit of borderline cases in that if that's what's fixing the reference just seems wrong, right? There could be a case where it can be unclear whether something is at least as long as the distance between those two scratches. Same thing is gonna to apply to something that's based on it like 3.2 millimeters. So there could be clear cases of things that are at least one meter long, clear cases of things that are not at least one meter long and borderline cases where our means of fixing the reference simply leave it open epistemically whether the thing is at least one meter long. Now, as an epistemicist, I think there is still a fact of the matter there, but I think we have no way of determining what that fact is any more in that case than we do in the case of baldness. It's just that the sorority susceptibility of these so-called precise notions doesn't come up very much in everyday life. So, you know, we don't have to deal with it on a regular basis, but there's no difference in principle seems to me, between the vagueness of something's being one meter long and somebody's being bald. It's just a difference in familiarity. Thank you so much. Yeah. And before saying anything else, I wonder if there are more rejoinders, comments, questions. Jim, go ahead. What? We can hear you. I, it seemed like you wanted to say something. Yeah. Uh, well, all I wanted to say uh, about the last comment from Jean, uh, I think maybe I shouldn't say, but at any rate, uh, it <laughs> seems to me that uh, uh, it seems to me that to the idea that there is such a property as being a meter in length is uh, not really accurate. And uh, there is such a property as being a meter in length in certain situations and by certain standards and the like. And this is a different property from being a meter in length for certain other standards and, and the like. And uh, the, uh, you, you can talk about a meter length in pure geometry, but of course, really that's quite empty. There's just the unit. And in pure geometry, the unit is fine. And uh, there's a difference between the unit, say zero, and 0 0.400 decimals uh, ending in one and 400 decimals ending in two. And there's as big a difference between those two as there is between any other intervals in, in, in geometry. Uh, but in physical applications, the meaning of ascribing meter length varies. So that's what's varying. In other words, uh, I, I would disagree with the way you were describing it, because I would say that there are different properties that are being identified. And often, of course, it happens that no property is being well identified, but, but it can be very clear. And uh, so I don't, I think it's a little oversimple to simply speak of a property of being meter length. Okay. But we disagree about these, these things. Well, we don't disagree about that. I'm, I'm perfectly content to agree that sometimes when people say something of the form, X is one meter long, that they're not expressing any property at all. That can certainly happen. And I'm also perfectly content to say that um, two different utterances of that same sentence type um, can be expressing different properties, uh, attributing different properties. So on that, we agree. Um, now, once so there are two things to be said once it's, we've agreed on this sort of general point that there can be this variability then there's a lot of nitty-gritty to do about individual cases and whether in fact two people are in fact expressing the same property or or not or two the same person on two different occasions yes. and i think that's very can, can be very hard to determine i think that's a matter of uh, figuring things out in dialogue as uh, somebody i know is, is uh, fond of emphasizing um but the other thing I'd say is this, look, my claim is the, the important claim for present purposes, we were talking about vagueness, is just this. Um, you wanna say, so take a case where on your view, there is some property being expressed. And I assume it's a property that is in some sense a length property. It's not a case where we're talking in code 
right? So we say that, oh, X is one meter in length means that it's gonna to rain tomorrow. We're talking about a length property of the sort that we would all recognize. So take a case where some property of that sort is in fact being expressed on your own view, right? I'm gonna put the onus on you. And I say, for that very property, there will be clear cases uh, in which it applies, clear cases in which it fails to apply, and borderline cases in which we have no way of knowing whether it applies. And that's all that I'm saying. That's just fine. But the property, of course, obeys the logical laws. Of course. And that makes them yeah, that makes them incompatible, <coughs> excuse me, with vagueness. Because every everything has either has a property or not, and not both. So here, it seems to me you're falling into this old pitfall of defining vagueness in a way that it excludes the epistemic view, right? You say that these are incompatible with vagueness, but that's only if vagueness is taken to be something like the rejection of, of bivalence or to require the rejection of bivalence. But no, you can think that there's vagueness and still uh, be fully on board with the laws of logic and just say va uh, vagueness just is what happens when we have these borderline cases where the predicate either, sorry, the property either fails to apply or it applies, but we have no way of determining which. Right? I see you avoiding the pitfall of defining vagueness. Of and, course. Uh, <laughs> it's a good strategy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. My, my strategy, I told you I try to avoid battles wherever I can. I also, when running through minefields, I try to watch where I put my feet. <laughs> that sounds amazing um so um um if i may let me interject a, a different question and it's going to be the last one from me and hopefully you're going to be uh uh kind enough to share the the draft so i won't ask the silly questions and i'll just read the the, the text first um um you start out by contrasting the core argument with your argument. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if I remember, um, um, if, if I roughly remember what, you, what your argument was, I think one of the premises went something like this, that the premises of the core argument are not implausible. Right or not unsound or not implausibly unsound, something like that. Sorry, I'm not implausibly sound. Right, so, 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 I forget. So each each yeah. premise I claim is yeah. not implausible, and I, I actually make a stronger claim for the first premise, which is that it is not merely not implausible, but right. extremely plausible. Right, right, I don't make right. a claim for the second premise, only for the first one. Good. So my question was, um, given that the premises of the core argument concerned, I mean, at least one of them, uh, materially concerned folk psychology, yeah. right? Um, how is the notion of plausibility cashed out? Because if it's not cashed out in terms of approximate accuracy or something like that, it's gotta be concerned with something like uh, credences. Uh, and then it would itself be the object of folk psychology. Right. Um, so, uh, first of all, the, the general point that I have done nothing to ex explicate the notion of plausibility is a fair and unhappy one. <laughs> That's right. I haven't yeah. said what I mean by plausibility. Yeah, this was a simple question coming from an undergrad. Yeah. Um, I, I, was, I, I was sort of expecting that question and hoping that we'd run out of time before we got to it. Um, so I haven't said what I mean by plausibility. Um, I do think that there's a variety of things that one might mean by it. Um, you might just mean subjective probability. Um, you might have a, a view that I think is less, in some ways less precise, but, but uh, in terms of there being a, a compelling reason to believe it, but not necessarily conclusive reason, right? Um, now I will say, if you do it in terms of credence, and I opened I opened that uh, gate when I was talking about conjunctive implausibility. I said I don't really believe in credences, but if you do, here's a way to make sense of this talk about conjunctive implausibility. Um, I don't think that credence is a folk psychological concept. 
that Creighton says it's used by Bayesian uh, psychologists. So, um, so could I perhaps interject something here? So, so, so what you're saying sounds exactly right, but when you talk about standards for believing or standards for the strength of one's belief, yeah. And there is some indirect specification of what the belief in question is, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I was with you until the very end. What do you mean, isn't there an indirect specification of what the belief so, is? So um, uh, granted that the standards in question yeah. could be insensitive to the believing that's so standardized, right? Um, but there are still standards for believing. So they presuppose the subject matter that they do standardize, right? Oh, right. So in other words, am I um, presupposing that we do in fact believe things? In other words, that beliefs exist? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to presuppose that. That doesn't, presupposing that does not, it seems to me, presuppose that there's any true folk psychological theory of belief, that there are laws that govern it, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is this was one of the complaints that was made against the eliminativists, like the Churchlands and Daniel Dennett, where they said, um, you know, these terms they get their content from the embedded theory. And a lot of people responded by saying, no, they don't. Right? You can accept the ontology of belief, desire, fear, and so on, without any commitment to a folk psychological theory in their sense at all. Right. But isn't there somebody that say, look, um, I'm not sure what being a meter long is. But whatever it is, it measures distances. Yep. Right? And so by parity of reasoning, someone, well, reasoning is a fancy word, but by parity, somebody might say, look, I'm not sure what um, believing is, but whatever it is, um, it's a norm that uh, beings uh, seek to believe what's plausible for them. Right. And so there seems to be a connection between folk psychology and these rational standards, even though it's somewhat indirect. So that this is an interesting philosophical thesis, <laughs> Andre. Um, I don't think it's true for what it's worth that um, uh, a, that a rational being must seek to believe that which is plausible. Um, I think that there are lots of things um, that are probably plausible in the sense of say, uh, well, I'm trying to avoid committing myself to what plausibility is, but in the sense that, for example, um, um, they would have the appearance of truth were I to consider them. That's one way of doing it, right? We talk about propositions appearing true um, or that I would have I would attach a certain subjective, high subjective probability to them were I to consider them, whatever else you want to put in there. I'm sure that there are lots of propositions that meet those standards. Um, and I have no interest whatsoever in trying to discover what they are or believe them, right? Um, yes, and, you, you don't, but shouldn't you? I, I don't see why. So um, look, th this is, I have, I have another paper in the works, maybe for another time. Um, the title Great. of which is, there is nothing you ought to believe. <laughs> Wonderful, right? um, that, yeah. that sounds amazing. I think there is nothing that you are rationally obligated to believe. And I can give you, look, I can give you the, the simple argument that's in that paper. It's like in this paper, it's a really short, simple argument and then lots and lots of elaboration and considering objection, right? But the simple argument is just this, um, if, um, there are things that we ought rationally to believe, then mere stupidity is the vice, right? An epistemic vice. But mere stupidity is not an epistemic vice. So there's nothing we ought to believe. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that is... Uh, uh, well, uh, rationality so comes in a lot of forms. The, the, you know, think about your logic students, right? They're the students who routinely affirm the consequent or something like that. We think that there's a defect in rationality. Mm -hmm. I'm not defending that. I'm not talking about having irrational beliefs. I'm talking about <laughs> willing to believe something. So suppose, so consider not the person who routinely affirms the consequent, but the person who just doesn't see modus ponens. They say, oh yeah, I see P, I see if P then Q, let's see what follows from that. And they think, right? And they think, and they think. Now look, we all know that um, you know, some people are quicker than others. 
most of us, be, by virtue of the profession that we've gone into, we've heard, we tend to be fairly quick about these things, right? We say, oh yeah, Q, <laughs> right? But um, of course, you know, from the, uh, from the perspective of say advanced aliens who are a whole lot smarter than we are, there would be all sorts of inferences that seem obvious to them that we struggle to see, right? And similarly, there are lots of our students who might struggle to see most. <laughs> it's, it's not that they form irrational beliefs, they just don't see it. They are slow, sometimes At slow. At this point, uh, Jane, you know, I'm happy I cleared the mode exponents bar. No. Yeah. <laughs> just... yeah. Now, see, I think that simply failing to see um, a consequence of something you believe, look, there's a sense in which it's an epistemic defect. I mean, we'd all prefer to be smart in that way rather than to be stupid in that way, mm -hmm. right? But to be, but to say it's an epistemic defect in some sense is not to say that you are doing anything irrational by simply failing to see a logical consequence of other things you hold and failing to infer it, right? You're just being slow. But being slow is not a, a failure of rationality. It's a mere failure of intelligence. So now I feel I want to read both papers. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much for that. Uh, if there are uh, more questions, comments, rejoinders for Professor Mills. And if not, this has been quite a treat. We're very grateful. Uh, very much hope to see you both. Uh, see you all. David, David is away again. Uh, I, I, the others I, I'm privileged to see in January, but, but you three, you're away. It would be such a treat to see you again. Take care. Thank you so much, Gene. And please join me in thanking Professor Mills. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And thanks to all of you for, for coming. I appreciate it.